All right, uh, thank you. Thanks to the organizers for the invitation. It's uh, great to be here. Um, so um, <clears throat> I, I feel like my talk is a little bit, in some sense, light on like kind of deep content or something like that. It's more of a kind of a, a attempt at some sort of philosophical persuasion or something like that. So uh, if, if the details you know, get um, confusing, please just stop and ask me you know, for a clarification. So the, the title, uh, what was the t top, um, <laughs> topological approaches to algebraic structures, maybe something like that? Okay, right. So it's not, it's kind of not really about that. I mean, secretly, the, um, so the talk is actually <laughs> about arithmetic, uh, broadly construed. So let me start by um, saying, um, what is arithmetic? <laughs> so um, by arithmetic, what I really mean is, I guess, like field theory of some sort. So arithmetic, in a general context, like over a field. So K is some field. And arithmetic over K, um, is um, kind of the, the difficulty of solving equations. That's what, a, that's, so what arithmetic will be in some sense, right? So we're interested in which um, systems of equations um, don't have solutions. Those are kind of the interesting ones. Um, when everything, when you can solve everything, like you're over the complex numbers, then there's no arithmetic to speak of, right? So, Okay, so for example, we're interested in things like uh, finite field extensions um, because these are defined by polynomials that don't have roots and you know, therefore they express um, some amount of arithmetic. And so, okay, so how do you, okay, that was, that was what's arithmetic, we're, we're done with that. Now, um, how do you actually study arithmetic? Um, I mean, in some sense, it's, it's kind of uh, far too broad, uh, obviously, to kind of uh, start with. I mean, some systems of equations are more interesting or important than others. And so kind of we'd like some guidance for kind of what, what are natural things to look at. And for that, um, let's just make an analogy with, uh, with manifolds, fields. So um, when you... Um, when you're interested in studying the topology of a manifold, uh, one important kind of thing to look at are what kinds of structures are supported by the manifold. So, um, so say structures supported. Well, th there will actually be math eventually. Just if you're, I mean, I will, there will be some content. It won't just be this, okay. So for manifolds, you can talk about things like um, orientations, um, coverings, uh, vector bundles. You can talk about, um, for example, singular cohomology. And um, many of these things have, um, have analogs, which one can make kind of very close analogs for, depending on how much uh, energy you have. Um, you know, for example, coverings kind of naturally correspond to Galois extensions. I guess regular coverings or whatever, whatever what I, I think, what do people call it? I don't know, normal coverings? Normal, regular coverings? Or, or Galois coverings? You could say. <laughs> um, and then, um, and then you know, vector bundles just would be vector spaces, but there's more interesting kinds of vector bundles with extra structure that you might consider. You know, so with extra structure, you got some natural objects over fields such as um, division algebras, quadratic forms, 
These are in some sense just vector spaces with interesting kind of natural structures on them. Uh, singular cohomology, in some sense uh, Galois cohomology is in some cases a good analogy for that. And these two, um, these two things, of course, have their own particular importance. Um, for example, they are kind of repositories of invariance for other kinds of algebra, for other kinds of structures. Um, and that kind of holds in both situations. Um, so, um, so, so these things are what, we, what we're going to think of as examples of algebraic structures. And the idea is that these algebraic structures um, also encode interesting collections of equations that maybe can fail to have solutions in ways that will inform us about arithmetic. Um, so just um, let me digress for a moment and talk about quadratic forms. Because they, they take so little to explain and they give so much back. Um, so, um, so quadratic form um, is, by definition, just a uh, homogeneous degree two polynomial, let's say, in k of x1 to xn, some number of variables. And if somebody gives you some quadratic form q over a field k, then the natural question is, um, does it have solutions, so to speak? Does it have roots? Does it have zeros? So you might say, does there exist um, a1 through a n equals, let's say, vector a, such that q of a is equal to 0? Well, I mean, I, you could be kind of stupid, but let's just not be stupid and say non-zero, right? Non-zero, because um, it's homogeneous. So you can always stick in 0. Um, and um, if so, we say that Q is um, isotropic. And so in general, you might ask this question like, you know, when is a form isotropic? That, that sounds kind of like overly general and, and silly again. But um, so let's get a flavor of it by thinking about a couple of specific kinds of quadratic forms. Um, so quadratic forms are particularly interesting um, because they uh, connect to a wide range of other structures. So just as a, as a silly uh, kind of a few basic examples, imagine a form in two variables, um, which is um, you take the first one and you subtract some multiple of the second one. Okay, Very concrete form. And then you could say, when is this thing isotropic? And of course, Q is isotropic. You can just kind of see after you kind of clear your denominators, after you plug it in, in some sense, this is isotropic if and only if um, A is a square. Okay, so this, you know, so this form being isotropic detects your squares and therefore, in particular, um, such forms encode um, Galois extensions of degree two, quadratic extensions. Um, slightly more interesting. feel my hand is going to going to get tired in just a moment. Okay, in, in four variables, you can look at the form x1 squared minus a x2 squared minus b x3 squared plus um, a b x4 squared. Okay, this this is a very kind of special form, um, and it turns out that this is isotropic if and only if a certain algebra. Um, which I'll write as ABK, is a matrix algebra. So this ABK is what's called a generalized quaternion algebra. It is an algebra generated by um, 
you know, two elements i and j, along with you know, everything in k, that have the property that i squared is a, and j squared is b, and ij is minus ji. Okay? So in general, you can write down these quaternion algebras. And um, so I'm assuming there are these a and b are non-zero. Um, but this form will be isotropic exactly when this quaternion algebra is isomorphic to a two by two matrix algebra. So you see that you know, certain, certain equations correspond to certain algebraic structures. So it turns out that this is either a division algebra or it's a matrix algebra. And so these division algebras give you kind of an interesting, um, kind of a particularly nicely behaved set of equations to look at that you can kind of think about as studying the arithmetic of these algebraic structures. And then it you know, tells you something about these. Uh, well, also gives you important information about the arithmetic of the fields. Um, OK. Um, and then I, I don't, I really, I'm not sure if I have the patience to write it, but you can do the same thing with an A, B, and a C. And I'm, you know, with a nice little pattern of, so it goes like, you know, minus A, minus B, minus C, plus A, B, plus A, C, plus B, C, minus A, B, C. So there's like eight things that you write down. And that thing turns out to be um, isotropic exactly when a generalized octonian algebra is a so-called split octonian algebra. OK. So, um, so you can see this nice interplay between different kinds of algebraic structures, different kinds of nicely behaved equations. And it turns out that, that these things also correspond to very special classes in Gallo cohomology, um, you know, et cetera. So quadratic forms are great because they connect to everything. Can you write lines to put additional A and B under each? Sorry? Um, can I write down a simple condition on A and B such that? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, I, I guess. I mean, so if B is a norm in the quadratic extension where you join a square root of A, that is the one equivalent condition for this thing being a matrix algebra. If, if you like that. <laughs> okay. Is that like lost to me forever, that board there? Uh, okay, whatever. I'll, let me. I'm not sure if I knew it, would know what to do with it yet, anyway, so it's okay. Okay. Um, so quadratic forms are great. It would be great if we understood them. We actually understand them not very well, in fact, okay, which maybe isn't a surprise. So, um, so one important question is, um, can we give just a general criterion that says quadratic forms of certain types will just always have solutions, okay? So, um, I asked, I don't feel like writing it again, but so I've said it, right? That's a question. Um, there are some nice examples um, when, when this kind of thing holds. So it's a very uh, nice classical result that if you have a finite field um, and, um, and then every quadratic form in more than two variables, you know, so in other words, three or more variables has a solution, always, you know, is always isotropic. Okay? In particular, there are no division algebras, which is a classical theorem of Wedderburn as well. Um, another, um, another example, um, if K is either a piadic field or, um, or a number field, let's say just um, to simplify things, let me assume that it's um, uh, imaginary. So no real embeddings of this number field. Then the same thing is true with the number four. So if you have at least, if you have more than four variables, then every quadratic form has a non-trivial zero, so five or more. In particular, there are no non-trivial octonian algebras over number fields. Um, 
So, um, it, you know, in, in general, it turns out it would be really wonderful to know um, what happens if k is something like, um, you know, number field adjoined t, you know, a transcendental extension of a number field. So um, the conjecture is that the same thing is true with the number 8 here. Um, and, and if we knew that, it would actually, I mean, it would, you know, I, I don't want to say, I don't want to kind of um, overstate it. I'm, I'm not actually sure what else you could prove with that. It's like, it's closely related to a bunch of things that relate to deep other things, but it wouldn't necessarily exactly solve them. So I don't, I don't know. I don't want to overbill it exactly, but it would be really great just like for our sanity or something if we knew. But unfortunately, it, at, at present, there's no known bound. So it's possible that forms with 100 variables can fail to have zeros for all we know. You can find some with eight variables that don't have zeros. And we believe that if at least nine, you have to have a zero. But there's no known bound. Um, on the other hand, um, with uh, kind of in, in very recent times, in the example of QPT, um, it was proved by um, uh, David Harbader, um, Julia Hartman, and myself in, um, in O eight, o 8 or 09, I think, and by Paramala and Suresh um, in 10. Actually, our, we, we proved it after they did, but our paper came out earlier by some quirk of fate. But they were done independently. Um, and, uh, and by Leap, eventually in uh, 13, um, it was, we know now that if you have eight variables or more, over, or more than eight variables over this field, then you have to have a zero. So eight, okay, for this. We were able to do everything but except um, p not two, and Leap was able to do p equals two. You know, two is always troublesome. Okay. Um, and so what, what I'm going to say a little bit um, about, although I'm not going to explain anything about how this is proved, I'm going to um, talk a little bit about the kinds of thinking that, um, that allowed um, us to prove this result and that gives some interesting kind of connections from, I don't know, a topological perspective um, on, this, on, on this field theory stuff. Okay. So... Okay. So one basic idea um, when you're studying, I don't know, say manifolds, I'm just guessing because I don't study manifolds, but I'm, I, I think, you know, um, <laughs> I hear people say things like this, right? So one thing that you do is you, you have your manifold and you break it into pieces that you understand and you stick it back together, right? Okay. <laughs> so um, is that fair? <laughs> okay. Um, so. The idea, um, this is a basic idea, right, <laughs> you know. Um, so, um, you know, with, with manifolds, this has, you know, lots of different ways to, to do it. So I'll say manifold pieces. Um, you know, you could maybe use some sort of like a, like a triangulation, which is some sort of simplicial decomposition, or maybe CW. These are kind of nice because the pieces are contractible and kind of topologically, um, you know, better. But you, you, don't, you don't have to, like, settle for just contractible chunks. You can make your pieces more interesting and just kind of, you know, but, but they should be simpler somehow, <laughs> right? So, or just simpler pieces of various sorts. And the idea is um, what, um, what our starting point was um, with, um, with Harbader and Hartman was to um, understand ways of doing um, kind of analogous decompositions with fields, right? So, you know, are there analogous uh, 
of some fields. And um, so as a, as a model, Um, I, what I'd like you to do is imagine the case of like uh, Riemann surfaces and meromorphic functions. So um, if you're used to, um, if you're already used to thinking in terms of algebraic geometry, um, then, um, so I'm just kind of saying a brief thing for the benefit of those who have some exposure. Um, it's really problematic to try to break up a function field of a variety in a way that has something to do with the, um, with the um, algebraic structure of the variety as, let's say, in the Zariski or Atoll topology or something like that, because um, every open set has the same function field. So you never get smaller, right? Um, on the other hand, um, in the analytic world, if you make a smaller disk, then the meromorphic functions, there are really more of them. You know, that you, because, you know, because um, you might have real problems with some crazy, um, like, singularities outside, but, you know, as you shrink the disk, you get more meromorphic functions. No, nevertheless, you can say that global meromorphic functions can be gotten by taking local meromorphic functions and identifying them on overlaps. So in some sense, what you can say is that um, your, um, your uh, so you can say that the, the global field of meromorphic functions Um, then uh, it somehow corresponds to um, to, to like a local um, on a cover plus gluing. Okay. Okay. So the idea then is in this case. Um, you can imagine that what, what's really happening is you're replacing a global field of meromorphic functions with maybe kind of local prototype fields, maybe just meromorphic functions on some disk, together with just a, um, with some diagram of how the fields are identified and attached, right? So you'd have to cover the overlaps with similar disks, and then you get some giant diagram of fields, which are all the same field, and a bunch of inclusions, and this giant diagram with inclusions would correspond to the global field. So if you can picture this diagram that I'm not going to try to draw, but, you know, diagram of like little dots sitting inside of bigger dots that identify them on different overlaps. So for each dot over here, maybe you have like two separate arrows saying where it goes and stuff like that. And you get this big diagram. If you draw that and then you, um, and then you kind of... Um, Okay, I'm not going to, uh, maybe, I, let me not try to argue visually, but like, if you, if you squint in the right way with this diagram, then what you'll see is the, is the, is the shape you started with, right? This, this, this diagram, um, if you, you know, will actually correspond to a simplicial complex that actually will give you back the surface. It's, you know, it's some sort of like, you know, like a triangulation of some sort. Okay. So what you're able to do is basically trade in the arithmetic of the field for like kind of some, uh, some kind of uniform arithmetic of meromorphic functions on a disk and some topological, combinatorial topological data of the interconnections. Okay. So, um, so, it, so, the, um, so the, the new insight is that it turns out can do this with, for example, QP and, and similar kinds of fields. Okay, so the idea is um, you can get a kind of a, a piatic analog of these kinds of uh, decompositions of meromorphic functions. And what this, what this leads to 
is a variety of things. On the one hand, so-called local global principles. Local global principles from this perspective is the idea that if you're lucky, you can ignore overlaps. So if, you're, if, you're, if your overlaps are somehow very small, no, that's not the right, I'm not sure exactly what the, what the visual interpretation is, but if your, analog, if your overlaps are very nice, you can somehow always trivialize your gluing data, and then depending on the problem, and just reduce it to a problem on each individual patch. And this means that the global is determined by just the local. It's, a, it's kind of a rare thing, but it does happen sometimes. And in particular, it's this, this local global principle in these contexts that lets us actually prove this, this theorem, in fact. Um, all right, so um, another thing that, you, that one gets is um, analogs of Meyer Viatora sequences. for Galois cohomology. So in just, in this kind of straight analogy with, um, you know, with what, with what would happen for a standard open cover and for singular cohomology, it turns out that, that this machine can tr will translate that into an analogous thing for, um, for Galois cohomology. I'm not really gonna talk about it because I'm just, you know, why, why talk about Galois cohomology? I'll talk about other things instead. And then, um, yeah, what I thought would be would be more fun would be the um, what is it what is it called? I didn't. Um, it's probably written somewhere else in my notes. But you know that thing with the fundamental group and like open sets and Van Kampen, Van Kampen. <laughs> um, so you also get like a Seifert Van Kampen. Um, for Galois groups. And I think that's what I'll, you know, give as an example application, because it's kind of fun. Okay. So, um, I was supposed to stop at 5.30, right? Or a little before, maybe, even or something. Oh, okay, okay. I probably won't. <laughs> but, you know, don't hold me to that, actually. We'll see. Okay. So um, let me draw a couple pictures so that you can get a flavor for what this kind of, um, you know, meromorphic gluing thing kind of looks like. So um, So as is, as is usual, um, you know, there's, there's like basically like one picture I know how to draw. So I'm gonna draw that picture. Um, so, the, um, so what I'm gonna describe is this thing called field patching. So this, um, this is a, um, it goes under the kind of larger umbrella of, you know, techniques of patching. So it's a generalization in some sense of like what are called like formal or rigid patching using either rigid or formal geometry. The nice thing about uh, field patching is the kind of basic objects are fields as opposed to rings. And if you like, uh, fields are often simpler to think about a lot of, uh, a lot of things are easier to think about, so um, so there are some just kind of practical advantages for, uh, for for doing field patching. So the idea was first developed by Harbader and Hartman in 06, and then the three of us kind of ex expanded it a bit and found some new applications. So um, so the basic idea is we're going to start um, with some. Um, let's just say some system of equations over something like uh, the p-adic integers. Um, and we're going to think about kind of global functions on this, on this thing and, um, and a way of breaking them up locally. So, the, so, what's, so the, the kind of thing to imagine 
is something like, um, so let's say uh, a sample field would be, um, we're interested in the field QPT, for example. So I said this is a, a good thing to, to think about. And then, um, so what we want to think about this is as coming from um, uh, uh, a line over the, uh, over the p-adic integers. So really, roughly, we're thinking of this as, um, as coming from the p-adic integers and a polynomial ring over that, something like that. We might want to add a point at infinity and think of it as a projective line instead, but that's, that's the idea. But um, because the line is really um, like kind of overly simple and you can't kind of like think about it in an interesting way, I'm going to imagine that instead we have some maybe an elliptic curve or something like that. Okay? So we'll imagine um, something like, as an example, that we're looking at uh, a curve of this sort y squared is x, x minus 1, x minus p. So the idea is if you have, a, if you have a, an equation, a system of equations over the p-adic integers, then, then you can at least reduce mod p, see what it looks like. So this is a, um, so this is a curve over zp, which if you mod out by p, um, gives you this, um, you know, gives you this, this nodal curve. Okay, so the idea is um, we're going to make, um, so that we're going to look at meromorphic functions in a um, tubular neighborhood of, um, of, of this curve. Uh, maybe, let me, maybe I should... Um, I feel like this. I feel like this example is not. I'm getting. The, I, I feel like I should. I could say it in a better way. If you haven't already seen algebraic geometry, this is probably not. Let me. Let me back up. Let me. Let me. Let me. Let's. Let's try something slightly different. Um, let's see. So it's what's a slightly better way to to say this. So, um, yeah, so, so let's think about it like what I, so the idea of QP, um, if you're not so used to it, is that P is small. And, you know, high powers of P give you something close to zero, and therefore you get some sort of convergence. So let me instead kind of um, imagine that we're over something like C adjoined epsilon. So these are power series in epsilon. Epsilon is so small that every series converges. And, um, and then, you know, so looking at something more like this, or maybe this, uh, in, or maybe we're thinking about, um, so, so, okay, so what is this? These are, you think of these as um, functions on the line, so I can plug in something for, for t. I can plug in either an actual number or I can plug in something like um, a number plus something a little bit small. So, like, what, what are the values I can plug in? You know, you can... Um, you think about epsilon as like lying in some very small interval around zero. So you can set epsilon to be something like close to zero. You can let t be anything at all, and it's like a it's like a little thin strip. So these things are like functions on a thin strip. I can plug in for t. I can plug in for epsilon. And okay, so so this is something like functions on a very thin long strip. Um, this thing, what I, I'm, so I'm thinking about p as small, so we should visualize this as like y squared equals x, x minus 1, um, x minus epsilon. And so the idea is, um, yeah, so I can, um, so, so I can think about plugging in, you know, for x and epsilon and y. y can be something in, you know, it can be a number. It can have a little epsilon factor or whatever. But the idea is that these, if you think about what are all the things I could plug in for, for these things, what, you should, what you're going to get is some sort of like a, it, it feels like, what, what should it you know, um, right, okay. It's like that, but it's like a tube around that thing. It's like some sort of a strip-like thing. So it's like a two-dimensional thing, and it's thin, 
which kind of makes sense because I had three variables and one equation, but one of my variables was small. Okay? So, like, um, so maybe the strip is coming out of the board a little bit, right? So the epsilon direction is here. I have the x and y plane where I've drawn it, and it comes out a little bit too. Okay? Okay, so that's, so that's the, uh, the flavor of, of what this thing looks like. And now if you can just pretend that P is small, it's the same kind of picture up there, but you kind of have to pretend that that makes sense. Okay. So the idea is this is, um, yeah, and if, if you like the real kind of comp, you know, complex picture here, of course, this thing that I've drawn is something more like a pinched torus. Like if epsilon was zero, it would be, it would look like, um, um, like something like that, if epsilon was zero. Epsilon isn't quite zero, so it doesn't quite pinch, but it gets like really small, okay? So that's what this shape is. It's like a, it's like a halo around this pinched torus. Okay. So, um, so the idea is because we have a notion of epsilon and convergent power series, we can use that to produce an idea of, of, of like some sort of a metric, which is to say things that are epsilon closer close so that you can at least get the distance between close things. You know, epsilon squared is even closer than epsilon, et cetera. And you can, you can use that to build um, something like analytic neighborhoods and, um, and uh, meromorphic functions on those things. Okay, so you have to, there's a little bit of a suspension of disbelief because when you actually write down what these rings of meromorphic functions and fields of meromorphic functions are, they look more complicated than the things that you started with. But they're easier. They look more complicated, but they're easier to use. Um, so, roughly speaking, just to kind of uh, cut to the chase, if you have, um, so if this is like a little like thin halo where the halo part comes out of the board, then the epsilon equals zero is just the actual pinch torus that's sitting on the board. And, the, um, and what you're doing is you're picking um, kind of uh, subsets of this. So we have like this, and we have this kind of like um, crossing point thing there. And we're making um, like tubular neighborhoods around, the, they're kind of like pinched neighborhoods around these things, like tubular we don't really have words, but I'll write down some actual symbols, and then you'll, you'll try to guess what the visualization was. Okay. So it'll be like neighborhoods around this thing, neighborhoods around this, and then these things will actually overlap each other in something that looks like, um, like that. Okay. It'll be like a little uh, thickened little crossing thing. It actually has two distinct parts. It has a this and a that. So it has two components in the, in the middle. Okay. Um, so what I, so at, at the end of the day, we will have, um, so we have this kind of open set. We have a point. We have what you can think of as like a, a, these two different branches at the point. And associated to each of these objects, there'll be, there'll be a field. So there'll be a field for you field for the first branch, field for the second branch, field for the point. And these fields will sit inside of each other in a way that reflects the way these things bump into each other. So smaller means bigger in the world of functions. As you make your open set smaller, you get more meromorphic functions. And so, the, so what you find is these branch things are the little ones, and these guys sit inside and the u's sit inside here. The u and the p are incomparable. You, neither one actually sits inside the other one. And you're, we're thinking about each of these as really open sets in some, in some metaphysical sense. Okay, 
So at the end of the day, um, kind of an, an analogy with the, um, what I said about the Riemann surfaces, we'll be able to replace the global functions, these global meromorphic functions, with, these, um, with this diagram of local functions. The interesting thing about it is that this diagram topologically is a circle. And it turns out that that's because, um, you know, there's like a circle going on in the graph. Or, you know, well, I don't know. It's because of that loop there. Okay. And so what you find is that you can, um, these, so, so these fields are in some sense will act as if they're kind of smaller dimensional, okay? So the idea is that this, this global field um, is like a, so complex dimensionally, it's like a thickened surface. No, it's a thickened curve, sorry. So it's kind of two-dimensional. This is two-dimensional. Each of these feels less than or equal to one-dimensional. And the diagram is kind of a one-dimensional diagram. So what you're able to do is basically do a dimension shifting argument to get um, things like this U invariant thing. So, okay. So let me actually just say concretely uh, what these fields are in one specific case. And then I will kind of um, give you a flavor for what um, Seifert Van Kampen looks like. Okay. so. Um, I'm not going to do this elliptic curve for the example because I want to actually be able to write down things. So let's imagine that we're looking at, um, at what we could call the projective line over a thickened infinitesimal interval. So, um, so for example, sitting inside of here is the affine line over a thickened little infinitesimal inter interval, which I think of as being the thing such that functions on it look like, um, look like this. Okay. So um, I'll draw it like this. Here's my curve. And then I can pick a point on that curve. So this is like P. The complement is going to be U. And there'll be some sort of an overlap. So let me now say what these, what these fields are. So for you, what I'm going to look at is um, functions. Uh, so I'll make P the point um, where kind of T equals 0 will be the point. So if I'm thinking about what are my functions on U, um, so I've, I, implicitly I'm also deleting the point out at infinity or whatever. So uh, you can add two more points, another point in later, but just for simplicity. So what I do is I look at functions that make sense at uh, t equal, you know, that make sense on that open set. So because I'm removing t equals zero, I'm allowed to invert t. One over t makes sense. But now, when you um, when you zoom in and look at an infinitesimal tubular neighborhood, that turns out to translating to completing this ring with respect to epsilon. So what that looks like is this. Okay, so there's a huge difference between where the double bars are. <laughs> so, um, so the whole point here is that you know if you um, you know so so these this is these are just power series. These are polynomials with power series coefficients. The the great thing about this is that it's complete in the sense you know, you can like take limits of things. Epsilon gets small, you take a big sum of things where the epsilon part's getting more and more epsilon-y, then this goes, this converges, right? Um, but that doesn't happen up here. You know, there, this isn't epsilon complete. So because this is complete, um, the, you know, you should imagine that Hinsel's lemma lets you solve all sorts of things that would be, would be difficult otherwise. And basically, it says that when you're lucky, you can 
solve things by ignoring epsilon, by calling it zero. Okay, so that's you know, the Reader's Digest Tinsel's lemma. You know, if you're lucky, then setting epsilon equal to zero gives a solution means you have a solution. Well, and that what that means is you can remove one of your dimensions, if you will, the little infinitesimal one. Okay, so that's this is um, what we might call R U, and then if you take the fraction field of that, that's the F U. Unfortunately, our language doesn't have a better word for that other than frac of blah, blah, blah. But that's what you do. That's the FU. And now what are the other ones? So the FP for this one. So I'm looking at, um, so I'm looking at functions that are close to t equals 0. So at t equals 0, my parameter is t. And so both epsilon is small and t is small. And so it turns out that you get just um, t power series in t and epsilon. And, this, uh, and then if you take the fractions of that, that gives you uh, the field at p. This is also a wonderful ring inside because it's complete. And you can often reduce to solving things over the complexes, for example, which is great. Um, the overlap fields, I'll just write them over here so that I can get rid of them later. The overlap fields are, well, there's only one overlap field because there's only one kind of branching direction. I can write it over here. So, the, so F sub branch looks like the fraction field of, um, so, so what am I doing? I'm looking at kind of where both of these things kind of make sense, the, the t and the t inverse, but also t is I've all kind of completed with respect to t as well. Um, so it ends up looking like um, c of, um, of um, well, if you have power series in t and then you invert t, that's Laurent series. And then I have to um, do the epsilon completion of that. So this is also can be written as um, C of T of epsilon. That's what this thing looks like. Okay. So the um, so the magic is that um, working over over the fraction field of of this which is um, this, working over this field turns out to be the same as working over this field and this field if you do it compatible, oh, sorry, this field and that field if you do it compatibly with respect to how they both sit inside this field. Okay, and that's, um, so this is an example of what we call field patching. So um, what, you know, so uh, one way to say that is that there is, um, uh, for example, an equivalence of categories of, um, of vector spaces with the tensor structure, an equivalence of monoidal categories for um, vector spaces over this field and pairs of vector spaces over these two fields together with isomorphisms over this field. So you might call that gluing data or descent data uh, category of such things. Okay, so so um, so let me just say um, just yeah. So uh, just in summary, why does this help you? It helps you because this field is not complete. It's not epsilon adequately complete in any way but you've replaced it entirely in terms of fraction fields of complete rings. This is not a fraction field of a complete ring because this th ring wasn't complete, but all these other things that you've retranslated it into are complete things. And then you can use Hensel's lemma and that just makes life easy. Okay, so, um,
Okay, so I will now say like a few words about Van Kampen just, just for fun. So, um, okay, so back, back to the real world, um, Van Kampen says that um, if you have, um, that if you have your space, X, and you have a couple of open sets, or U and V, and their intersection is uh, path connected, then the fundamental group of X is the fundamental group of one piece amalgamated over the fundamental group of the overlap with the fundamental group of V. Okay. Of course, you know, you, sh you should never write this kind of thing because, I mean, you should really write the base points, right? So that we know what we're talking about. I mean, the point here is that you can choose a base point that lies in the intersection. And when you do, when you do that and you put little x's everywhere, then this is a really natural um, isomorphism. OK. But I, I don't know, have you, have you ever bumped into, like, what, what if u intersect v isn't path connected, right? So like, what if you have like that, right? So this is u, this is v, and you're, you have u intersect v um, 1 and u intersect v uh, 2. So what does the Van Kampen theorem say? Or maybe it doesn't have anything to say. It has something to say, right? This is where the talk stops. <laughs> Do you know what happens? It's a great answer. There's, there's an answer. Do you know the, I didn't. What would you like to pick? That's the problem, right? What, what base point? So the problem was the question, what base point? The real question is, which base points? Mm, right? So you have to pick two base points. And you shouldn't look at the fundamental group. You should look at the fundamental groupoid with two base points or however many base points you need. So instead of picking one base point, you pick two. OK? And you can talk about the, um, the fundamental group of x with respect to these two base points. It's or the fundamental groupoid. So a groupoid, you know, you can sometimes compose and sometimes you can't. But the point is, like, as a, you know, abstractly, these are the paths that begin and end at either x1 or x2. So if, they, if one begins at x1 and one ends at x1, then you can compose them. Uh, or, but otherwise, you know, you typically maybe can't, but it's a groupoid. Okay? And um, the deal is, like, there are, this thing um, receives maps from pi 1 of u in these two base points. And... Um, pi 1 of v in these two base points. Each of these receives maps from pi 1 of u1 intersect, uh, or u intersect v sub 1 in the first base point. And they also receive maps from the other one in those other two base points. And really, this is the, the push out in the category of groupoids of this diagram of groupoids. So there's another one that maps to both of these. And the nice thing is the one interesting observation is that this circle in the diagram is this circle around here, so to speak. Right. So, um, so the fact that your open sets are missing this bit of the fundamental group that goes around is encoded in the fact that your diagram has a circle in it. And the push out kind of captures that circle. Okay. So the um, so the 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 punchline is you get a Van Kampen theorem 
in the context of these of the Galois groups, but it's really of the Galois groupoids. So because you have inclusions of all these fields in the branches, you, so to actually, so what's a Galois groupoid, right? I mean, when you, when, there's really no such thing as the Galois group of a field in some sense, because you have to choose an algebraic closure to identify it with an actual group. So it's really FF bar, so to speak. And F bar is the base point. Okay? So really the 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 Galois group are automorphisms of F bar, but you could choose a couple of base points, a couple of different algebraic closures. And then the the um, the Galois groupoid of this thing are the isomorphisms between the different algebraic closures, like the paths between the base points, if you will. Okay, so with these Galois groupoids, you, um, the idea is first you choose algebraic closures for the branches, and then there are closures of the FP within those other algebraic closures and the FUs, so you get a, a system of compatible algebraic closures and the push out of the groupoids gives you the Galois groupoid of your, of your field F. Okay. So this is something that you can get with the patching stuff. Okay, that's, that's enough. Let me stop. Thank you. Oh yeah, so um, so these arrows in some sense should be a different color, right? So this is the thing I'm trying to describe. And the idea is that the, the Galois groupoid of the whole space is some sort of a push out of the Galois groupoids of the parts. So there are some kind of arrows going here which are from the push out thing. And the diagram which this is a push out of is a diagram of a system of four groups. Um, one, two, four groupoids. This, 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 and this. Groupoids for, for these four parts. The two overlaps and the two open sets. And the idea is that the way these four groupoids map to each other has a circle in it. And I'm just, you know, I'm kind of throwing this out there. Yeah, this is a circle. That's what I mean. Oh, I'm sorry, this isn't an arrow. This is just a badly drawn, like, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. no. Yeah, the, so these arrows are only, are, these arrows are not going, you're going against the grain by, make, by calling it a circle. I mean, you have to, like, move some arrows another way by making a circle. Nonetheless, <laughs> the, um, I'm saying this circle is kind of visually this circle. So that is to say, like, I mean, if you're, if you want to describe, um, like, where, so there is a loop that goes all the way around in this, in this, um, in this fundamental groupoid, and that loop does not lie in any of the constituent groupoids that make up this pushout. That loop is an artifact of the way these groupoids are mapping to each other in this configuration. That's you know some heuristic explanation or whatever, but but morally, I'm just saying this this loop is is reflecting that loop. Sure. Uh, sorry, yeah. when you say the Galois group of the field, you know, I mean, you don't mean the Galois group of an extension. You mean like the uh, absolute, the absolute, yeah. Uh, the absolute Galois group, um, you could um, you could say it's just um, automorphisms from an algebraic closure to itself that fix the, the the ground field. Right. So you're saying that they're all like they're all isomorphic, but they depend on the choice of the closure. Yeah. I mean, so that is to say, like, um, you know, if um, if you if you pick some field, you know. And you have one way of, of writing its algebraic closure, for example, in the complex numbers or whatever. But then somebody else has, their, has some other 
way that they like to take the algebraic closure. You know, there's some other algebraic closure of this. But you know, there's up to isomorphism, there's only one. So there exists some map from here to there. Now, if you, if you think about what are all the automorphisms of this, and the, then this isomorphism will give you an isomorphism of those Galois groups. But different choices of this will give you different isomorphisms of those groups. And for example, like, you know, if you, if you look at just a, a map from this to itself, that'll induce conjugation on the Galois group. And that's just like, I mean, just like when you're, when you, when you're choosing different base points, the, the fundamental group can get messed up up to conjugation, and that's just what happens. Yeah. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so the, so the, the deal is, um, you're, so you're, you're basically, at, at, yeah, here's, what it, here's how it basically looks. Um, you're trying to solve, you know, some, you're trying to solve, can I solve making some quadratic form equal to zero, right? And so um, what you do, what you can do is, you can show fairly easily that over fields like this, if they're kind of well chosen, if you kind of choose your open sets U kind of nicely, you can essentially reduce down and always solve them. The, the point being like, um, you know, because you're, um, it, it works something roughly like this. You have, a, if you pretend you have a nine dimensional form over like QP adjoin a variable, you look at it on one of these little bits, so this is like secretly P or something, right? So you re, you, if you set it up nicely, then when you reduce mod epsilon, you can, um, so it's like you imagine some terms have epsilons and some don't. Um, you can kind of rescale things so that it either has a one or an epsilon, that epsilon squares, you can kind of divide off squares and, right? And so you have nine terms. So like more than half either have an epsilon or don't, right? So after you kind of rescale things, you can assume that more that at least five don't have an epsilon. Then you go mod epsilon, and now you're over um, a finite field to join an indeterminate, it turns out, where I didn't say, but it turns out that there more than five gives you an non-trivial zero, and you kind of reduce it and solve down there. Now you have to do this kind of like make all your um, solutions compatible, but it turns out that um, that you know, the orthogonal group is just so nice that you can just kind of like correct all your solutions by kind of like um, you know choosing nice like things in the orthogonal group. So the the orthogonal group is like kind of well parameterized. It's this Cayley trick they call it, you know, and you can just kind of write down nice little paths that let you re like line up your sections. So I'll prove. <laughs> 